please help me in welcoming Justin Halpern to your screen. Hey, Justin, Pablo. thanks for doing this. No, no problem. Thanks for having me. Um, some people may be aware that uh, we know each other a little bit. We used to have a podcast together. And um, as I was prepping for this, I was thinking about how I felt going into this. And what I will say is that because you and I have spent so much time together, I feel a little self-conscious about the way that I speak and the jokes that I make because it's sort of like one of my brothers where you're going to see through my shit really quickly. Yeah, I think that's fair. I usually and, try to see through your shit. Yeah, and so that makes me like, it makes me a little uh, uh, self-conscious. So um, I guess that's a good thing. Yeah, that's good, Paul. <laughs> I need a little more of that. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> Um, tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about where you are in the world right now. Where are you radioing in from? Uh, well, so I live in Los Feliz, um, and, uh, like everybody else, I'm quarantining. I have two kids though. Mm -hmm. So, and my wife also works full time. So we kind of switch off, split the day up where I'll watch the kids in the morning and then write in the afternoon and vice versa. Or she's not a writer. She's a therapist. Um, and, uh, you know, it's hard, <laughs> it's tough. I see a lot of people being like, if you don't write anything during this time, like, don't worry about it. Like you're doing the best you can. And I agree with the sentiment of that, except it's my job. So, <laughs> and I have to turn things in because I've been paid to do them. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's been stressful. It's been stressful. I agree with the sentiment of, of like, if, if you're not under deadline to turn something in, like take it easy on yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but because I, I'm in the lucky position of being paid to write, uh, it's definitely been challenging to find the time to write anything that's any good. Mm -hmm. Like in four, four hours is enough time to like write something and then realize none of it works. <laughs> you need the next four hours to be the four hours that you're like, right. oh, and then this is how we fix it, except it just restarts every day. So it's a little Groundhog Day-ish. Um, I was somewhere recently saw something about the sort of self-help book that says, take it easy on yourself, which is kind of the sentiment that you're talking about and how they're kind of worthless because the people who need those sorts of sentiments are never going to read that book. And the people who do read it are the people who are already taking it easy on themselves and just need the justification to take it easier on themselves. It's like uh, my, my, it's like, you know, that friend you have who will be like, all of a sudden they'll make a declaration like, uh, you know what? I've decided now I'm going to start taking some time for me. Mm -hmm. And it's the, it's the most self-centered friend you have. And you're like, <laughs> You, what have right. you been doing previous to this? Like you've been planning yeah. your own birthday for two months. Like, yeah, course. the, uh, any, any, like, this is of course a big thing on the old Instagram, any public declaration of like a restart, like th uh, this is my year or week or month or whatever. You're like, it's not going to be, I don't think this is it. <laughs> um, it's is that, it yeah. I, I don't begrudge like anybody feeling any certain way during this time because I feel like there is so much going on that is awful that mm -hmm. uh, it affects us all in different ways. And and for me, like I'm in such an advantageous position because I'm not currently like worried about uh, my job. Like I, you know, I have a steady job and and I have shelter and I have, you know, like I'm okay. So it's like, uh, I try to keep that in perspective as I'm, you know, getting through this. Yeah. So speaking of the job, currently uh, you are co-creator and executive producer of Harley Quinn. Mm -hmm. um, and congratulations, first of all, on the success of that show. I, of course, follow you on Twitter and see the super fans coming in and talking about like, alternate ending shows and stuff, which I feel like is when you know you've made it in the comic book world, like there are people out there who are so invested that they're like, I need the, another version of this. Yeah, no, I know. I've never, I, I, my dream was always to, cause I've been on a lot of shitty shows. Uh, I've created some and I've been on staff of some that are bad. 
Um, and I always sort of dreamed of working on a show where people like pick through it with a fine tooth comb and they're like Reddit threads and mm-hmm. all kinds of shit like that. Uh, and so this became that show and it was so gratifying, you know? And so I try to like, uh, even when people will, there's one guy who was like at adding me every day to be like, you fucked this up. Like you absolutely did like you fucked it up. You destroy it. And, and I don't think he was realizing that the effect that I was having from it was like, I did it. <laughs> like I made a show <laughs> where someone, someone cares enough to do it every day to tell me what a fuck up I am. Um, so I, it, it's been, it's been really gratifying to see people like engaged with the material like that. Cause I just never had that before in my career. I, I've mostly made forgettable stuff. Mm-hmm. So speaking of forgettable things, um, I wonder this, we, I think one thing that is interesting about talking to someone you know really well is that sometimes you've skipped over the big questions. I noticed this with like my brothers where I, I see the brother who lives in LA three times a week and then he'll say something to like my parents, if we're all together, that I'll be like, Whoa, I didn't know all of that. So my semi profound question would be, you talk a lot about the the failings that you've had, the, the mistakes you've made, whatever. And of course, those failings and mistakes have led to you continuing to create and you making more things. Do you feel like there's anything that was trained in you from an early age that allowed you to pick yourself up? You're saying I've failed up is what you're saying, Paul. Well, <laughs> I mean, it's, I think it's, no. <laughs> I think that anybody who, I know you well enough that I've seen the ups and downs, right? When, when you're dead or when I'm dead, probably no one's like, no one's going to remember you for how to be a gentleman. Right. Right. So, but they'll remember, they'll remember the high points. So not right now in our lives together, I've seen all of the, the things that haven't gone well, you know, 50 years from now, nobody's going to even think about those things. They'll just think about like, Hey, this is the guy whose first book sold a zillion copies. And then he wrote the show and he wrote another show and they were all so we're watching you in real time deal with these things. And they're not failures like uh, you drove a car off of a, the side of a mountain. They're failures like, you know, we didn't make this show quite as well as we wanted. Yeah. Um, so anyway, do you feel like there's anything that, that trained that in you when you were younger? You know, I played baseball my whole life. I played baseball in college. Um, and, you know, I think sports just in general what was one thing that definitely like I had to get used to losing because you just do it a lot when you play sports, no matter how good you are. Um, and also the idea that there was always someone you, I could physically see someone better than me next to me or working harder than I was next mm-hmm. to me. And, and I could see sometimes even when someone was better than me and they were working harder than me, sometimes they would fail. And sometimes when I was working harder than someone else and I felt like I was better than someone else, I would fail. And so I think what it did for me was made me realize that like failure does not equate, is, is not always tied to talent or hard work. You know, mm-hmm. failure is just like a thing that happens that a lot of times, even in sports, which I would argue is like the biggest meritocracy, the closest thing to a meritocracy we have even though there's a lot of politics and bullshit in it too. Um, even in that, you know, uh, failure just happens and you don't always earn it. Um, so that was definitely one thing. I think the other thing was, is that, uh, it was, I remember this conversation I had with my dad. So, and it's a, based around sports, but it, it has a larger meaning. Is I, I, uh, in, I was in Little League All-Stars and we were playing in like the regional tournament. And if we won we would go to the, to the state finals and, you know, state, you win state, then you go to Williamsport or Williamsburg, whatever, um, Williamsport to play in the little league world series. So, and it's like the biggest thing that could ever happen to a 12 year old. <laughs> um, and so, uh, I, uh, I'm pitching in this game and it's, it's three to one, I think. And it's the last, it's the sixth inning. It's three to one. There's two outs. The bases are loaded. And I've, I've, pitched like three innings I came in in like the third and I pitched really well and there's a ground ball back to me and I I pick it up and I step and I throw and I throw the ball away and and three runs score and we lose 
oh. um, four to three and, and we were out of the tournament. And if we had won, we would have gone to state regionals. So like I'm walking off the field and like my face is going to burst with tears. Like if anyone says anything to me at all about anything, like if I have mm. to utter a word, it's just going to be snot and tears. And so, and I remember this, our coach came running up and he was like, it's just a game. It's just a game. It's just a game. And my dad was basically like, get the fuck out of here. Like, let me, let me, let me handle my son. And so we're walking and it's quiet. And I finally have the, like, I can finally like get the words out. I'm like, are, he's like, I want to talk to you. And I'm like, you're going to tell me it's just a game. And he was like, no, he's like, this is a big fucking deal. And you blew it. Like, you blew it. You blew it in like the worst way you could possibly blow it. You blew it. And I'm like, I'm like reeling. And I'm like, how, the, how is this making me feel better? And he was like, look, yeah, you know, like you, I, the re, the fact that you're bawling and you're so upset is a good sign because it means that you care. It's like mm -hmm. if you walked off the field after doing that and you were just like, eh, let's get in the car and go get ice cream, it means you were doing something you didn't give a shit about. And, mm -hmm. and the idea that, you know, like when you fail, it should hurt. It should be painful. And if it's not, it means that maybe you don't care about it as much as you should be. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe it means it's just not the thing for you, you know, if it's not, if you don't feel it. And so I remember taking that feeling and, and I try to think about that when I have like a big loss in my career, when I have a show that comes out and it doesn't come out well and it's bad and it gets shit on or, or it doesn't even get that far. It's a pilot I write and it gets, it doesn't get picked up or it's a, it's a, you know, something, a book proposal, it doesn't go, um, and it hurts and I feel it and I've worked on it. I try to remember that. And, and it, and I try to use that to gauge if I'm doing the right thing, if it's hurting, but I'm failing, it means I'm doing the right thing. Mm, yeah. I, I think that could be the, uh, the pithy pull quote from this podcast. <laughs> if it hurts when I fail, then I'm doing the right thing. Um, I want to back up a little bit because not everyone is as familiar with your entire backstory. And in order to do that, I'm going to attempt to tell your backstory and you can correct me along oh, the way fun. instead of you having to recapitulate it for the 97th time. I would love this. Okay. So here's my understanding. Um, you're from San Diego. Your father, uh, as is uh, mentioned many times on your Twitter account and in your first book, Shit My Dad Says, uh, is somewhat uh, irascible, maybe, would be a good word to describe sure. him. Uh, incidentally, I've read Justin's father's novel, or one of them, there may be two now, uh, A two Far now. Piece to Canaan, mm -hmm. uh, and he's also a good writer, not as good as Justin, for, for better <laughs> or worse. Anyway, um, so you grew up in San Diego, you went to, uh, San, wait, is it San Diego State? Mm -hmm. San Diego State, where you played baseball for two years, is that right? Two years and then didn't play the third. Right. Uh, you were a pitcher at San Diego State. Uh, and then when you left San Diego, you moved to Los Angeles, I believe, to attempt to work in writing TV. I think, had you, had you and Pat, your current co-writer, already met at that point? Yeah, we had already been partners. So one thing that should not be lost in this is that Justin um, writes as part of a team. Uh, we will speed up now because I can tell I'm taking too long already. Um, that didn't go as planned, so you moved back home. I think there might have been a breakup in there. Is that right? Yeah. So the breakup caused me to, to move back home. I basically showed up at my girlfriend's door uh, after having in San Diego, and I was living in L.A. and been like, let's live together. And she was like, we need to talk. <laughs> We I need to talk. To yeah. yeah, nobody ever is like, we need to talk about how you're right. <laughs> yeah. You made the right choice. That's what we need to talk about. So then you move back to San Diego. And um, uh, m from my understanding, you started the Twitter feed mostly as a way to sort of like jot down notes, the, the shit my dad says Twitter feed. Yeah. Um, and that started to catch attention. I, I don't remember because it's all lost. Like, it's interesting how quickly the internet has evolved because it like it, it's not that long ago that things were very different. So like what year was this? That This is 2009. 2009. Okay. So you're an, a fairly early adoptee of Twitter and the shit my dad says account got some attention that led to 
a book deal. And this is where it gets a little fuzzy for me because I don't know, did that lead you straight back to LA or how did you end up coming back to Los Angeles? So I, yeah, so I got a, uh, a book agent reached out to me after seeing the Twitter feed and was basically like, hey, there might be a book in this. And I was like, hey, I'm actually a writer. And he was like, okay, <laughs> settle down. Let's just, <laughs> let's just put the tweets in a book and we'll call it a day. Uh, and I was like, no, let me, let me, let me actually, I was writing for magazines at the time. And I was like, let me actually write a few stories and give you a, an idea of what the book would actually look like. He read them. He liked them. We, we wrote a propo proposal, submitted it and the book sold. And when the book sold, the proposal uh, kind of just like went out into Hollywood as what happens when a book proposal sells sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and then we started getting a lot of incoming calls about uh, turning it into a movie or a show or whatever. Um, and then once it uh, sold, I was, was living, I moved, I moved back up here in the sense that I was like sleeping on my friend's couch up here because I would have all these meetings. Mm -hmm. And then um, when it sold as a TV show, I started uh, living here. I was mm. just like, I got to rent an apartment and like do this again. Um, and so that's when I kind of moved back up. Did that feel like a success? Like, did you feel the sense of I, it didn't work here. I went home, I did another thing and then I came back and now this is working or were you too caught up in it? Uh, I don't know that I was like, I, it definitely felt like a success. I definitely felt, um, really like invigorated and on a high and and that like things were changing mm -hmm. um i you know i didn't really know whether or not uh it would last or if it would if it would happen and i think what really started to change for me is when the book came out and it did um really well uh like the first few weeks and then it got to number one on the bestseller list within a few weeks and at that point, I was like, okay, even if the TV thing does not work out, um, I have some money coming in and I have potentially a future in books. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was my, uh, it just felt like suddenly like, oh, okay, like I've, I've caught something and I'm mm -hmm. moving with it uh, versus like, I'm just like running alongside a train being like, let me in, <laughs> let me come in. Right, right. So one thing that, that hits me about all of that is that you adopted a, a, a technology that was fairly new and, and put it to your own use, but not necessarily with, an, with a goal in mind, as far as I know. I mean, the goal maybe was like, I'm just going to jot down notes, right? No, I mean, to be totally <laughs> frank, I had a friend, a guy named Eric Becker. He had been on Twitter um, and he was the one who was like, hey, you should move these, these to Twitter. Uh, mm -hmm. and I can't really take much, <laughs> much credit for it at all. Other than I said, okay, Eric. And I, uh, did it. And right. he had a small following and he retweeted it. He was like, can I retweet this? And I was like, sure. What a time um, when people would ask you if they could retweet things. Yeah. Well, he's a courteous guy, I think, cause it was about my dad. So he wasn't sure if I even right. wanted it. Like, I mean, my thinking was like, nobody's going to give a shit about this. So do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that, uh, yeah, that that um, that's kind of what started it. I, I I wish I could take more credit for adopting Twitter, but I well, really I, I mean, so you're uh, of course quite modest. I I think one thing that is important to to bring out of that is yes, it's not necessarily that hard to tweet, you know, what your dad says. However, what's difficult, even though it's you know a little deceptive because this doesn't sound difficult compared to like building the pyramids is doing it day after day after day. Right. So I think the reason I'm kind of headed down this path of conversation is to, to think about for the listener who's a writer and is wondering like, well, I'm not going to start a Twitter feed that's going to catch the world on fire because Twitter like that, those days are gone, right? Like, yeah. There's yeah. no way that's, that's impossible. You're not going to become an Instagram influencer unless you are cast in a movie and then you use that to become an Instagram influencer. But I think there's value in thinking about not, not even having to do with social media, but like what's a thing that you can do day after day after day. I remember 
in early Twitter days because I had gotten caught up pretty quickly in it and, and liked to post jokes and all that, but like realized I'm going to run out of material real quick. Um, so I started doing a, a thing where each day to start my day, I would hit shuffle on my iPod. As, as you know, Justin, I'm a big music fan and you are not to your frustration sometimes. Um, so I would hit shuffle and I would just say something about the first song that came up. It was, I just called it random start. And, and I did it every day and like, it didn't build a massive following, but I remember it gave me that touchstone of like, well, I'm at least doing something every day that gives me a little sense that uh, of continuity. Um, and so like, I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking about what could someone do now that's similar. I don't even mean you should go out and find this social media outlet. Is there anything, pieces of advice you would give along those lines? Well, I mean, you know, I, I was such a uh, beneficiary of timing, right? Like, it's like what you said, like if I started shit my dad says now, it, I, I don't even think it would make any noise whatsoever. I, I don't know that anyone would really give a shit. And, and if they did, it would be a small following or something. You know, it, it just, uh, people were kind of at the time wondering what Twitter was mm -hmm. and how to use it. And then I came along and I was using it differently than people were using it. And people were like, oh, this feels interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I agree with you in the sense that like, you know, I, I think that engaging <laughs> with, I mean, it's like what standups talk about it a lot, right? But like engaging with an audience, however limited that audience may be, um, allows you to have like feedback on your thoughts. Mm -hmm. and, or even just your feelings, you know, like you're sending that tweet out about what you're listening to and, and you're, con you know, you're having a conversation sometimes with people who are reacting to that. And it, I think sometimes those things can help kind of like, I think a big part of writing is just like figuring out what your voice is, right? Like, why is your voice specific? Why mm -hmm. is it going to cut through the, the noise um, and the clutter, you know? And, and I think that for me, at least, engaging with audience with an audience uh, helps me refine my voice and like what I do. So like, I don't tweet that much. Well, from the shit my dad says account, I haven't tweeted in like a couple of years. But like in my own personal account, it's not a big following. You know, I mean, in terms of like followings, it's it's like maybe uh, you know forty thousand people, but um, uh, it's enough, even if it was. 4,000 or a thousand if you're if you know the people and you can kind of like engage with them and you're putting jokes out there if that's what you like to write or your thoughts out there or anything like that like I I remember early on in Twitter uh, this account I used to follow that was like the first line of a novel somebody would just write so every day would be the diff a different first line of a novel mm -hmm. and I remember thinking like what a great way to use Twitter because this person is getting reactions to what is a lot of times one of the most important lines in a novel you're going to write. Mm -hmm. And he's seeing the ones that are like, in, or she's seeing the ones that are engaging the audience, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't think you need to have a clever, you know, uh, uh, some kind of like clever Twitter persona or anything like that. I think just like, you know, every day kind of like, being able to engage with an audience for me, I think is really valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, one thing that comes to mind there might even be um, if you're, if you're working on fiction, go to five of your friends and say, every day I'm going to email you three sentences from a story mm -hmm. or something. And I just want, I just want you to read it. I don't want your feedback. The, the reason that this is, is on my mind is maybe the vastness of, the internet and how a lot of times I think it's really intimidating in this time and age to see a body of work like yours, right? And and think, well, shit, I don't know how to get from A to Z, um, especially because he's got a certain map that he took and I can't replicate that. So so what are ways, like thinking about creative ways for to help people consider that it's always going to start with three people or five people or eight people. So if that's, you have to um, offer that I'm buying all the drinks. We're having, you know, a, a writing night and it'll be at my house on the third Tuesday of each night. And I'll provide the wine just cause I, I know that I need to like 
try out my stuff. Um, I think it's, I think we live in a time that is, is really intimidating because of the size of people's followings, you know? Yeah. And I also think like, you know, uh, those like intimate, more intimate gatherings that are with people, you know, uh, or even people you don't know, but they're, the gathering size is still small, Mm -hmm. um, are really invaluable because, uh, you, it, it, you, you can like get a word in, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Like when you're in a large conversation online, when you're in something, if you're, you know, if even if like I had one, I had a tweet, um, it was a while back, but it got a ton of retweets. It got like 10,000 retweets or something like that. And it was shockingly unrewarding. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> Oh, one of my tweets went viral. Like this is going to be, I mean, off my personal page, I was like, this is going to be, but there's no conversation to be had because there's just a billion, when you have something like that, like a, there's so many people respond, you know, all mm. responding and there's a bunch of clutter and shit. And then there's people, there's just like porn stars putting up their response. Cause they just are like, Oh, I'm going to tag on this tweet. And like, mm -hmm. um, and it just kind of like, uh, it, 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 it just takes away the conversation. But when you're in a smaller conversation, like, you can really in, you can you can really get a lot out of it you know and what if you've written something and you've sent it to three friends like those three friends are going to respond to it you can have a conversation with them about it you can you can focus you know mm -hmm. um, yeah and, and like you said there's there's the chance that somebody then is going to like really pour over it too yeah and and also they know they're accountable for what they're saying mm -hmm. you know if you're in a massive conversation you know, you're not that accountable because you know your voice is going to get drowned out. So it's like, whatever you say, you put less thought into what you're saying. Mm -hmm. But if you're in a conversation with four people, you're going to be careful and, and think about what you're going to, at least I hope you are, yeah. you know, because it's going to be heard. Well, and, and even in thinking about what you were talking about with your goal to have somebody who, who watches a show you make go so deep that they like hate every decision you've made. Right. So, you know, I was just thinking about with my first book, which was kind of papered together, but there was actually, there was something I was going for in the way that I built it. And I remember one person like emailing me and saying like, Oh, I see what you were trying to do. And I was like, yes, thank you. Like that feeling of that one person truly connecting with it was so much more valuable than say a thousand people just saying like, that ah, was all right. You know, or, or 500 people saying like, yeah, I liked your book, whatever. Um, there's something really gratifying about that. And I think we all know that deep down, but we're kind of sold this idea that like, unless you have a billion Instagram followers, you're not worth a damn. Um, and, I, and I think that's worth getting back to that sense that like, we can start small with uh, the small gathering, the small group of people to read our stuff. Yeah. And I think that that, that a lot of times is, you know, when it'll start to like build anyway, like some of my favorite, just using Twitter again as an example, but like some of my favorite Twitter accounts online are, are ones where you can tell it was just like kind of built up, like they built their larger followings by just kind of like interacting with other funny people and kind of like you, you see exchanges between people and they're really funny. And you're like, Oh, I, I like, you know, like the, I always think about like, when I'm listening to a podcast, like I want the podcasters to feel like they are enjoying it, <laughs> you know, right. like, like they're having a good time, you know, like, mm -hmm. uh, it's like why I feel like I respond better to a podcast than I, or, than I do to like a book on an audible book, you know, mm -hmm. cause it's, it's not a conversation. I'm just hearing somebody read to me. Yeah. Um, and so I think it is, it's like, it's like, I want, I want to get a piece of like an authentic interaction and I want to like see that. And, and I like, that's what I like. Yeah. You know? The, uh, there's a, an Amy Poehler quote, which I'm sure she modified from other people. Cause it doesn't sound, it sounds a little too good that it just came out five years ago, but basically no one looks stupid if they're having fun. Um, and I think that is so true for content, right? Like if, if you're just enjoying yourself, people want to be around people who are enjoying themselves and they don't really care about the mistakes you make. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, I think that, uh, like I look at my first book, um, 
and I read it now and I'm like, oh man, there's so many things I did poorly mm-hmm. in that book. But I wrote it with, I think, a lot of um, love for the subject matter. Mm-hmm. Like I love my dad. I really enjoy our relationship. And I also have a lot of feelings ab- about it that are conflicting, but that I feel strongly about. And I think if you read the book, that's what I think people are reacting to is like, I'm, you know, my dad as a character is somebody who, uh, you know, I think you can tell that I like, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Cause there's another way to write that book. Like my dad is irascible is an, is a nice way of putting a- asshole, you know? <laughs> um, and I think there's a way of writing that book where you can tell I don't like him, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that book's less successful, um, but I do like him. I love, I love him. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and so I think it's like, it is that thing of like, yeah, if you think the audience is liking it, like that's why we always talk about when, we're, when my partner and I are writing scripts, if we get to the point where we don't like something that we're writing, we're like, well, if we don't like it. No one is going to like it. <laughs> like at least we have to like it. Cause if we're not liking it, like, and by the way, I get to a point on, we get to a point on every single thing we write, Mm. where we're like i fucking hate this but Mm. i think just at the end there has to be you have to start from a place at least of i really like it Mm -hmm. well you you know you use the term love right like you don't you're not always you're you're not always liking all of your family but there's a deeper love and i've I've heard people talk about how especially with your characters if you find there's there's sometimes a temptation to make someone truly awful but there has to be a measure of like i love this character in some way for it to be real otherwise it's just like oh you just made a forgive the term but a cartoon character of a of a person you didn't make a real person there and i think that's sort of true of like the larger piece that we work on in that like you can get so frustrated with it but at its core you still love it yeah, absolutely. Like I, I'm watching, have you watched that show, The Great on Hulu? Oh uh, yeah. Way into that show. Yeah. I loved it. And, and one of the main characters is like just a detestable, awful mm-hmm. person, but he's, you can tell that they took pains to like find the human moments in him mm-hmm. and that they, they love him. The people who wrote it love him and they don't, and it's not just this thing where they're like, Oh, I'm going to get out all my like angry misogynistic feelings through this mm-hmm. character. I'm, I'm going to launder them in this character. It feels like, no, they're coming to terms with mm-hmm. these feelings, but then also like trying to show you like where they're, where they're coming from and how to like humanize it. And they clearly love writing Nicholas Holt's character, Peter mm-hmm. the Great in, in the show. And, and it's a character that done another way is just a cartoon character. Yeah. You know, that yeah. nobody invests in. Mm-hmm. Um, Let's dive into a few questions from our fine audience. Uh, The first one comes from Austin. He says that he's a big fan of uh, Harley Quinn, and um, he wonders, how much do you subscribe to Hero's Journey slash monomyth ideas? I love books like Vogler's Writer's Journey, but I don't know how practical it is as writing advice sometimes. Your thoughts? I think it's pretty practical. I mean, like, I'm not... Uh, I think I learned pretty early on in my career that I'm probably not, I'm not talented enough to be able to play with the form and fuck it up and come back to you with this thing that has blown your mind that you've never seen before. That's not where my skills lie. Mm. Um, So I oftentimes am trying to follow what I believe is like a good character arc that is tried and true. And then where my skills, I feel like lie are in the dialogue or in the, you know, in the character building or in those moments in between. Um, and so for me, I think that those things have a lot of value. They're like, I look at them as like um, roadmaps, right? Like you, if you're going to drive from here, from Los Angeles to, you know, Washington, DC, you can, that, that's your map, you know, and you might take a lot of turns along the way, but at least you have a map and the map says, this is the way to go. You might hit traffic here. You're like, well, fuck, I got to take the 10 for a little bit. I got to do whatever, you know, but, but for me, it's, it's, it's why I, 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 you know, I think about that stuff a lot. Um, and I'm, 
constantly like thinking about, you know, like I've read Vogler's book. I, I don't like reference them now, you know, I, I've been doing it kind of long enough where I feel like intuitively I know, I know if I'm straying away from that map, you know, mm -hmm. like I've, I've taken this drive a lot of times. Um, uh, but uh, I find them really helpful. I definitely subscribe to them. I mean, and I know a lot of great writers who do. And like, I don't think, uh, I talk to my old film school like once a year and a lot, and I get, I get a similar question. And a lot of people are like, I want to, you know, play with the form. I want to like, and I was like, well, more power to you if you feel like you can do that. But I also think you can do something amazing and uh, just unbelievable in within these like forms. Like we've seen them, you know, mm -hmm. like probably your favorite movie uh, ascribes to this or, or a book, you know? Mm -hmm. um so yes the answer is yes i think they're very valuable um and there's something as just like a general roadmap that you can use but then venture off into your own direction so in in talking about that thinking about i am such a believer in um trying out stories on lots of people um in that in the course of telling stories you learn what works about those stories, but then you can start to apply them to other stories, right? So like then you, you're, you become aware of like, well, if I, if I start this way, I don't hook them and they're, they've stopped listening and they've gone back to drinking with their friends. But if I start this way, then that connects with them. Mm -hmm. And one thing that comes to mind with regard to your career is that you have been very game to do other sorts of writing. So um, as an example, my brother and I were, were laughing about your, um, fake inboxes the other day. Like you used to, used to do like, here's what Tom Brady's inbox probably looks like. Um, and I, and I think that that has so much to gain. There's so much to gain from that because you start to see like, Oh, well I over here, I dropped that punchline, you know, 30 seconds into this inbox piece right? Like I knew where their eyes were going to go or whatever. And that that might help you with the novel you're working on. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's a no, little I bit like, like, it's a little, this is, you could make the case that this is like an old man talking, but I'm, I'm so glad I got to play multiple sports as a kid because one teaches you about the others, you know, like there, there right now is a lot of specialization that happens. And I think there's so much value in like, for me, I was never going to be a great pitcher, but I pitched for a long time. And that allowed me to think about like focus. Like when you're pitching, you have to be so hyper-focused for a second. And then you have to like kind of let it go and then refocus again. Um, that then applies to basketball or high jump or whatever else. And in thinking about like a, a roadmap of a story, learning how that map works in whatever context or whatever genre can only help the other genres. Yeah, I, I absolutely think that. And one of the reasons why I like writing in all different sorts of mediums is uh, because it it exercises just a different part of my brain. Like those inboxes are visual jokes mixed with, you know, uh, actual written jokes. And that is really fun because I don't normally get to do that, you know, or an, an essay is a, a way for me to like you know, tell a single story and not have to worry about it being so like visual and, and a, you know, screenplay, like I, it all kind of like, it all sharpens, you know, steel sharpens steel kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, I agree. Uh, Candace wonders, uh, she has an incredibly quotable father and she laughed out loud reading your book like everyone else who read it. When writing nonfiction, what creative liberties, if any, do you believe are appropriate in order to enhance the comedic or dramatic effect of the writing? Uh, I think, you know, quite a bit. Like, I remember, <laughs> I remember this thing, like, I don't know, first of all, it's all based on your memory, right? You know, for, it starts from your, your memory, which is a lie. Like, your mm -hmm. memory itself is, is not correct. Um, it, it just scientifically, it's not. Like, you're remembering things from your, things from your own perspective, right? And so what I did when like people would always be like, how did you remember every single word that every single person said? And I was like, I didn't. Uh, what I did was I remembered the conversation I was having and I remembered the moments in it. And, and I did my best like approximation of what was happening, you know? And, mm -hmm. and the thing that I did was I, I was worried about it being like too far off from what, from what actually happened, you know, because it's just my memory, you know, mm -hmm. especially from when I'm little. Um, 
a lot of it from when I was little. So I sat with my dad and I went through the book with him to mm -hmm. hear his point of view and hear what he thought. And I incorporated a lot of that into the book, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so for me, nonfiction, I remember reading this interview with uh, Augustine Burroughs who had written like his fifth memoir or something. And they were like, you describe this scene when you're like five and you say how the walls smelled. And they were like, can you really remember that when you were five? And he was like, absolutely. I remember every single thing about every single. And I was like, dude, no, you don't. <laughs> you don't, you know? Right. Uh, and, and so I feel like I don't want to, like, I would never lie in the book, like make, make something up whole cloth that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, if you're writing nonfiction, like, I feel like that's a betrayal, but I feel like if you're writing what you think happened and you are, you know, I mean, this is obviously two different things. Like if you're writing something, if you're writing a piece about like, you know, a journalistic piece, like you need to get everything fucking right. Um, mm -hmm. But if you're writing like a, a nonfiction story that is like, you know, comedic or this or that, like, and also the big thing is I remove things that I don't think help the story, you know? Um, I remove things that like hurt comedic timing. I remove things that hurt dramatic punches. Um, and I add in, I like, you know, I'll, I'll add in more of something that I think helps it. So I wouldn't be like slavish to that kind of stuff because I think unless you're writing, like, again, I think if you're trying to like appropriate something like, you know, you're going like, it, it's a story about like beating a drug addiction. Like, I feel like morally it feels like wrong to like approximate things. Like, I think you should do it as best as you can to like get it right but again that's still based off your memory you know it's based off your feelings like if you're staying true to those things and you're trying to tell your truth that's all nonfiction piece is it's just your truth it doesn't mean it's the truth um then i think it's it's fine i think it's also worth um encouraging someone if you are intimidated by the detail that comes out in some people's nonfiction to just start writing your own nonfiction and you will be surprised at how much detail you uncover in the process. Yeah. I've noticed, I've noticed that in my own stuff where I was like, wow, I did not know that that was somewhere in there. But when I started writing, it just started to like kind of come back, you know? Yeah. Like I remember uh, one of the stories in my book is like all about, I, I was like four and, and I, I, washed my dad's car I told him I was gonna wash his car and he didn't really pay attention and I went out and I filled the car it was a convertible and I filled it up with water <laughs> and ruined, the, ruined the car um and I wrote the story and when I when my dad read through it I had gotten so many things wrong in the story mm. um and it wasn't I wasn't trying to lie I was just like telling the story as I remembered it and so I think like you know, you should, you should try to get all of the facts correct, but y you have liberty, I think, to leave out things as long as they're not like fundamentally changing the truth, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, I'll probably get fucking roasted for this, but that, that's how I feel about a like nonfiction humor book. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, I think that's, I think that's where every rational person will land. Um, I, this is a very, um, targeted not targeted that sounds like we're gonna put you in a target uh this is a very uh practical question okay obviously there's a lot of chance involved in this industry but do you have any suggestions for actionable steps that writers who have been working for 10 plus years can take to use their small successes and find their way toward representation slash staffing slash selling yeah definitely i think like well we're in a unique time right now because um, there's a collective action by the WGA against the talent agencies. So where we all basically fire our agents so nobody has any agents. So it's not out of the question to, for an executive to get an email from a writer being like, Hey, I'm this writer and I have this blah, blah, blah idea. So I think you have access if you can find people's emails, which are really easy to find. You have access to, people you wouldn't normally like the gatekeepers in a way are kind of gone um uh which makes it harder to find the gates but easier to get in once once you find them um uh so there's that and then i think the biggest thing is is um just to like continually write and make things and finish them you know 
Um, because I think nobody wants to look at like, I have the first 10 pages of a script. I have the first bit of a novel. I have, you know, like people don't want that um, because they want to look at like a finished product. Um, mm -hmm. And also, you know, it's really tough to get people to digest bigger things. So like the thing that I did when I was trying to break in before I had my like big break that would get me a lot of meetings and stuff is I did, uh, I knew nobody liked reading scripts. Like nobody likes reading scripts. Um, it's hard to get people to sit down and read a script because it takes a lot of time and focus. Um, and so what we, I knew that. And so my partner and I did this thing where we took a highlights for children magazine. Remember those? Of course. Um, and we, when Photoshop, we removed all of the uh, words and then put in our own and made it this like very fucked up and weird highlights for children magazine. And I remember I got so many meetings off of that magazine and I would always send the magazine with like my two samples. Mm. Um, and then we'd go into the meeting and they had never read the two samples. They had only just read this highlights magazine been like, Oh, this is really funny. And then they'd bring us in to like talk about it and meet. Um, and so I always tell people like, you know, everybody's submitting scripts and you should have scripts and you should have written scripts, but it's also, you know, if you have an idea for a really great, like two page, three page short story, you want to send somebody, or you have a great idea for like, you know, some Photoshop thing you did or you have wh whatever, just if you have something that you feel like captures your voice, that is a different thing than everyone else is sending in. Like I, I'm, my old uh, mentor, Bill Lawrence, who's like been a showrunner for a really long time, Bill one time got this, he got, somebody sent him, this is like 12 or 13 years ago, somebody sent him an envelope and it said writing sample and it was a DVD and he was like, that's weird. And he put in the DVD and it was just a video of the guy typing on the keyboard. You couldn't see what he was writing, but it was like a sample of what it looked like when he was writing. And it was, it was funny. It was just one joke. Uh, and it made Bill laugh and Bill brought the guy in and they ended up having a good conversation and he ended up hiring him on something. So, you know, I think that uh, being able to think outside the box a little bit on whatever you're going to do, I mm -hmm. think helps and just continuing to make material because at some point, you know, I think you will get your opportunity to be in front of somebody. And then that's when you want to have, like when I had shit, my dad says happen. I had been writing for seven years before that with little success, but I had a lot, I had a few things that I had done that I really liked and felt good about. And those things were then what the, were what like got me in the door once or got me work uh, employment once I got in the door. Mm -hmm. I like all of those things. I was just listening. Um, okay. Last question. And this is going to come from, yeah, you know what? It's it's from an anonymous attendee. That's their name. Um, I love writing, but on a recent film project, a friend of mine suggested I look into being a producer. Problem is, I don't know what that entails. What can you tell me about producing and the executive producing process behind Harley Quinn? I mean, man, that uh, that's a that's an age old like Hollywood question. Like, what does a producer do? Mm -hmm. um, I would say to you first off, it is infinitely easier to break into LA as a writer or a director than it is as a producer. Mm. Because for the exact reason that it is not always exactly known, what does a good producer do? Um, like I have the title of on Harley Quinn of executive producer, but I am the executive producer and co-showrunner of the show. So like I get that producer title and I am producing all the episodes and I'm going to edits and I'm going to, voice records and or the way my partner is you know or you know i'm running the writer so i'm like i'm doing many things that all are under the scope of producing the show um but uh my job is a writer and i get just get the title of executive producer and there's another executive producer on the show who's just like in charge of the animation you know um and so uh i think it's sort of like a nebulous um title and I think that because it's a nebulous title, it makes it hard to break in. But at the same time, like I know like the good producers I know are the ones who go out and find projects that they think are really great, champion that project, get it made. And then, you know, if the project takes off, then they're hoping to like continue to, but it's just harder. It's harder because the first person who gets like lopped off when you go up to the next level, you have a, you have a great project. 
and then uh, everybody gets stuff out of that project, but that producer is usually the one lopped off and the director goes off and does something, but he doesn't bring the producer with him, you know, or she doesn't bring the producer with him. So, uh, her. So it, it's, I would say, you know, if you like writing, write and, and you will be executive producing your writing. Would it, would it be fair to say that producing is either mechanics or money? I, I, it's weird. It's, it's sometimes it's neither of those things. Yeah. You know, sometimes it, it, it really is like one of those weird jobs where you can never like quite put your finger on like what they, I, I've been on projects that I've done where I'm like, what the fuck does this producer do? Like, what are they doing? They're not like adding anything to this project. Like how do they have this job? Mm -hmm. um, and then I've been on other things where I'm like, this producer is fantastic. I could never make the show without them. Like they're right. so good. You yeah. Know? How are so, they not, how are they not running the studio? Right. Yeah. Uh, Justin, thank you for doing this. Thank you for being um, podcast guest number one. I'm, I'm honored, Paul. It's a, uh, it's a bit of continuity. I, we didn't get to talk any, basketball and i apologize because i know that you love to talk about basketball more than i do i, I know that you hate it so i would never make <laughs> well, you do that on your own podcast in, in 20 years we will restart a uh, short corner and then everyone's hunger for nba takes will be sated we were ahead of our time paul we were uh thanks dude i appreciate it and uh can you uh is would you say that uh, the best way for people to pay attention to you is on twitter if they just want to stay in touch yeah, that's like the thing that I check most often. I have an Instagram that I almost never check. I never check Facebook. I haven't checked it in two years, probably. So, so. follow Justin on on uh, on Twitter, and yeah. uh, if you want to send him the zaniest writing sample you can come up with, I support this behavior. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bye. Take care, man. Guys, thank you so much for being here. I do think that uh, that you should take my advice. Follow Justin on Twitter, and in like two weeks, send him a note, check in to see how he is. Um, he has sort of a lot of followers, but I bet he'll respond to you, and who knows where that will go.